Hey everyone, welcome to my shop. Thanks for joining me for another patron Q&A where I answer questions submitted by our Patreon supporters. Now if you'd like to support our efforts and have your questions answered right here on the channel, please consider joining our Patreon community. We'll have more information on how you can go about doing so at the end of the video. Right now though, let's get into today's questions. So our first question today comes from Roberto. Roberto says, one thing that came up in your miter boards video and has come up are reference faces. Seems to me that getting a good grasp on reference edges and faces is an important and fundamental skill for hand tool work. So a reference primer would be great. Um, yeah, so let's talk about uh, reference faces and edges for a couple minutes. Um, the first thing to keep in mind is that there are really no hard, fast, set rules other than you should be using reference faces and edges. So what is a reference face and what is a reference edge? Just for folks who, uh, who, who haven't, uh, are, aren't familiar with them. So when we take a board in hand work and we want to, we plane that board up, we get it nice and flat on one face, we get one edge straight and square to that face. Those, that face and that edge become our reference faces, uh, our reference face and our reference edge. The reason for that, uh, that we use those reference faces and reference edges is because we want to make sure we're always um, referencing our layout tools off of a flat, uh, a flat reference or a square corner reference. So for example, if we're going to lay out with our square, and let's say we've decided that this face here um, is going to be our reference face, and this edge is going to be our reference edge. So anytime we're laying out to, uh, to, to make a square um, cut on this, we want to reference our square off of one of these two faces. So if I'm going to scribe a line across the face of the board, I want to reference the square here. Similarly, if I want to draw a line down the edge, I want to reference off of the reference face. So here, or if it's this edge, I want to put it here. And then again, if I want to scribe across this back face, which is the non-reference face, I look for my reference edge, which is, was here, and I reference the square off of that same edge. And that way, my square lines match up all the way around. Now, the reason we want to do this is because if, for uh, our example, these two faces are not perfectly parallel to each other, or if these two edges are not perfectly parallel to each other, we're not going to get a line that's perfectly square around this board. We need a reference. If these two edges are not perfectly parallel to each other, and we reference a square off of one, well, if they're not parallel, then when we reference the square off this other edge, the line that we draw based on this edge is not going to be square to this edge. So we want to always make sure that we choose an edge and a face and that is that one face and one edge is where we're going to reference our square. If we're marking here or here or if we're marking here or here. Never from this edge, never from this face. So why is that important? Well, let's think about a couple of examples. Let's look at something like a cabinet door, okay? If we, if we take this apart and we've got some joinery here, okay? This is just my, my little sample mortise and tenon raised panel. So we've got some joinery here. If we were to lay out the shoulder for this tenon and we laid out one face, one, one shoulder off of here, off of this edge, the edge with the groove. And then we, when we came around, 
to mark this other shoulder, we flipped the board over and we marked it off of that edge. If these two edges are not parallel to each other, these shoulder lines are not going to be parallel. One of them will be square to this face, one of them will be square to this face. And when we saw those lines, we're gonna get two shoulder lines that don't line up. So when we go to assemble this joint, what's gonna happen is we're not going to get that nice tight shoulder on the front and the back. One of those shoulders will probably pull up tight, the other one will not, there'll be a big gap there. Okay, so that's one reason why we want to use uh, reference faces in that situation. The question always comes up though, which edge and which face should you make your reference? My rule for myself, and this again, this is not a rule or even a rule of thumb. This is just the way that I do it. It's not, there's no right or wrong. Um, it's certainly not the only way, but this is how I always think about things. If I'm working on a piece that has joinery, mortise and tendon frame, for example, I want, I'm going to make my, um, my mating surfaces my reference points, my reference edges. So, in the case of this mortise and tenon, I've got two mating surfaces here. I'm going to use the inside edges here on both of these pieces as my reference edges because I'm cutting joinery, this shoulder here, that needs to meet this face. So, and, I, and this interior angle, once this is assembled, I want this angle to be perfectly square. So I'm going to reference off of this face here and this face here so that I can make sure that when I assemble this, this angle is perfectly square. Now, why is that important? Well, I'm gonna make a square panel. So I wanna put that panel in there and I want this interior of the door panel, the door frame, the interior portion of it to be square. The exterior portion, if it's not perfectly square, Again, these exterior edges is what I'm talking about. Not such a big deal because most likely you're gonna plane these edges anyway after assembly, after the glue is dried because you've either gotta fit that door opening, you've gotta you've got fit that door to a case of some sort. So you may have to intentionally plane this, um, this door out of square if you have to fit it to an out of square opening. Um, also, you're gonna to wanna to clean up these mortise and tenons and you may um, get things slightly out of square when you're doing that, so you may need to make some adjustments. So to me, it's important to make this interior portion square so that my panel fits well, I get a nice reveal on my raised panel, um, and all those things work well. So I'm gonna use the inside surface um, of the joinery faces when I'm going to um, when I'm gonna mark my references. For the reference face in something like this, I typically use the inside of the door. And that may seem counterintuitive because the outside of the door, well, that's gonna be the pretty face, right? It is, and I'm gonna clean that up and I'm gonna make that, that side look nicer. That side's gonna have the nicer grain. That side's gonna um, maybe be completely free of knots and maybe there'll be a little pin knot or something on the inside but I want this side good and flat because again, this door has to fit into a door opening in some type of case. And I want the back side of this to sit and close flat when I assemble this door. When I put this on my bench, I don't want this frame to rock at all. I want it to sit flat. If there's a little bit of inconsistency on this side, I'm not concerned about that. I can plane that flush. That doesn't have to contact anything. That doesn't have to close flat. That's just the outside show surface. Back here, I want this surface where these two mortise and tenon shoulders come together to be as flat as possible. I don't wanna to have to plane this if I don't have to. Um, and if I do have to plane it, I want it to be very, very little because I don't wanna introduce any twist or out of flatness to this frame because I need to fit that into the case. 
this is the pretty surface, that's fine. I can plane this afterwards, not gonna hurt anything. If I have to take any significant amount of material off the inside of this, then my door is not gonna close correctly. It's not gonna close flat. So that would be a situation where I would want to use the inside face as my reference for, for joinery. Um, similarly, if I'm making a box, let's look at dovetails. My reference face is going to be that inside edge because I want this to come up square. I want this angle here. When I put these dovetails together, this needs to come together square. The outside I can clean up, not a big deal. I can plane that if it's not square, uh, perfectly square and I need it to be, I can plane it after assembly so that it is square. But if this inside does not come out perfectly square, um, there's really no way to fix that after assembling. Uh, in terms of a reference edge on dovetails, it depends on what I'm going to be using that piece for. Um, if it's going to be, let's say a drawer, I'll typically use the bottom edge as uh, my reference. Um, if, check that, I'll use the bottom edge as my reference if all the pieces are the same height. I'll use the top edge as my reference if I'm going to have a drawer where the, the bottom of the drawer is, uh, is gonna slide under the back. So then I can't use, if, if I've got a drawer where um, the backboard is shorter so that the, the bottom can slide underneath it, then I can't use the bottom surface. Um, so then I'll use the top surface. But I wanna, I wanna use consistent surface on all four of my drawer sides. So if, my drawer, if I'm making a drawer and I've got four drawer sides, I'm gonna make the, use the top of that drawer um, as my reference. And that way when my dovetails come together, the top should be all lined up. All right, so our next question actually comes from two different people. Uh, related questions, so I'm gonna try and cover them both uh, in, the, in the same discussion. Um, so the first person that asked uh, was, is Jay. He says, I recently bought a vintage Stanley 46 plane, which is a skew plane with two skates and an adjustable fence. The plane works well cutting grooves with the grain, but recently I tried to cut a dado across the grain and it didn't work too well. It may be that I need to sharpen the cutting spurs to get it to work better. Is there another tool or technique that you use for rabbits and dados? So that's our first question from Jay. And our second question, which again is related, uh, comes from Matt. And he says, any chance you could discuss rabbit planes? I'd like to hear about advantages of skewed versus straight irons, wooden versus metal bodied, and perhaps about proper usage. So we're gonna talk about rabbit planes uh, and dado planes and uh, the Stanley 46. So um, there's, been a lot of ink spilled over the years about the combination planes and the Stanley 46 is a, a plane that I group into the same category as the combination planes. Um, essentially what it is is a plow plane that has been modified to use more than um, you know to, to do more than just plowing grooves. So a plow plane um, to me is really, it excels at one thing, and that is cutting grooves along the grain. And what you realize, Jay, and in, in, you mentioned in, your, uh, in your, your question, was that the Stanley 46 does a good job of cutting grooves along the grain. Um, and I would expect it to, because that's ultimately what plow planes were designed to do. This is an example of a plow plane. Uh, it's got a thin skate, and it's got a blade, um, it actually comes with a, a set of blades. Um, this is a, a record number 44, I think, yeah, number 44. And it comes with a set of blades in different widths. And it's designed to make grooves along the grain of various widths. Well, the skate, this thin metal skate that the blade rests against is what really makes the plow plane do its job uh, because it allows it to it allows the plane to use different width blades uh, to cut different width grooves and that's a great thing for a plow plane 
The problem is that Stanley saw this and decided that they could use it for more than just plowing grooves. So they started to include wider blades for things like rabbits. They started to put on cutting spurs on it so that you could plane rabbits and, uh, and dados across the grain. And they even made the Stanley 46, which is a skewed iron version. And we'll talk about the difference between straight and skewed irons in a second. But the 46 is a skewed iron version, which theoretically should work better across the grain. And from the few conversations I've had with folks who have a good amount of experience with the Stanley 46, the Stanley 46 can be set up to do an okay job at cutting dados because of the skewed iron. Um, but it's not something that any combination plane excels at. When it comes to making moldings, when it comes to making rabbits, when it comes to planing dados across the grain or rabbits across the grain, um, the combination planes tend to come up short. They just don't work all that well because they're a tool that was designed for one thing that was modified to make it okay at doing something else, but it doesn't excel at any of those tasks. Um, a better option are the planes that were designed for those functions. So specifically for rabbits, a better plane would be a moving philister or a skew rabbit plane. Um, these are designed to cut across the grain and they, and they do it very well. Um, for making dados, in my opinion, the best, best tool for the job is a dado plane. Um, now these came in multiple widths and let's, let's zoom in and, uh, and get a closer look at these. So dado planes came in various widths and this is a, uh, two different ones that I have here. Um, I have a, a, this one here is 3 eighths of an inch wide. This one here is 13 sixteenths of an inch wide. Most manufacturers of dado planes made them um, in widths starting at about a quarter of an inch and they went up an eighth of an inch until you hit uh, one inch. So quarter, three eighths, half, five eighths, three quarter, seven eighths, uh, and some even made one inch. Many also included the 13 sixteenths um, in that because this was a common size for hand planed lumber during the period. So 13 sixteenths was very, uh, is very common and I find it's very useful to have um, when you're planing a lot of your lumber by hand. Now, the wonderful thing about these is, is you have a scoring iron in the front. Let's see if we can take this one out and you can get a better look at it. Okay, so it's got two spurs, sharp spurs that score the sides of the dado before the main skewed cutting iron uh, peel out the, uh, the waste between the score marks. And that skewed cutting iron uh, makes a very nice cross grain cut as opposed to a square straight across iron um, that doesn't, it does okay, but it doesn't tend, it doesn't cut quite as well across the grain. Now, the downfall or, or perceived downside to dado planes like these is that they come in standard widths and if you want to cut more than one size dado, you need, uh, you need a plane for every size dado that you want to cut, which can be portrayed as true, but is not entirely true. And I did an entire uh, video on tuning up and using a dado plane, so I'll link to that um, to that video and also put it down in the show notes. Um, but suffice it to say, you can use a smaller plane to plane a various different size dados. Uh, in fact, these are the two planes, the only two dado planes that I have these days. I've sold all my other sizes. This size I kept the th uh, 13 16 because it's just so useful when you're for casework. Um, when you're planing all your lumber by hand, that 13 16 and I love that, I, lo I just really like that 13 16 thickness, the look of it. So much nicer than three quarters. Three quarters looks so boring and stale and, and you know, Home Depot-y. Um, that 13 16 thickness just gives the piece a little something more exciting to me. 
The three eighths though is really the workhorse of the, of the pair because by planing dados in succession, so one right next to the other, you can plane multiple dados and you can make any width you want. So if you want to make a half inch dado, you can use this three eighth inch dado plane by planing a three eighth inch dado, moving the batten that you're plane against and planing uh, another eighth of an inch off to get you up to a half of an inch. So, uh, but using the dado plane is fairly straightforward. Get the, the knickers nice and sharp, get the iron nice and sharp, make sure the iron is not cutting outside of the knickers, otherwise you're gonna tear the piece apart. Nail a batten to the piece that you wanna plane, and then this side of the fence of the, uh, of the plane will ride against that batten and that's how you're going to plane your dado. That's essentially you're nailing a fence onto your workpiece and your dado will ride against that fence. Your dado plane will ride against the fence. So this is really, in my eyes, um, the best tool for making, making a dado. Let's talk a little bit about rabbit planes. Okay, so here I have three different examples of rabbit planes. These two are unfenced. This would be a fenced rabbit plane, also known as a moving philister plane. Um, these came, both of these versions, both types of planes come in uh, wooden versions and metal versions. Um, the wooden versions of these planes are just called rabbit planes. The metal versions of these planes are usually referred to as shoulder planes. Uh, they're slightly different in that a wooden rabbit plane is bedded with the iron beveled down and a shoulder plane is bedded at a, at a lower bed angle but the iron is um, bedded bevel up. But essentially they're similar planes and, uh, and you can do similar things with them. Um, wooden and metal rabbit planes both came in skewed and straight irons. Um, most shoulder planes come in a straight iron, like this rabbit plane here. Um, you can get metal, rabbit, metal fenced rabbit planes in both skewed and straight iron versions. Um, again, the skewed iron versions tend to be much better at cutting across the grain. The challenge with the skewed iron version though is that it becomes a little bit harder to start a rabbit with an unfenced plane when your iron is skewed because this skewed angle here makes the, the plane want to pull itself. So if, you, uh, if you're going to plane, plane a rabbit, let's say this is our board and we're going to use our fingers as a fence and we're going to plane a rabbit along here, well because that iron is skewed it wants to pull the plane this way. So it becomes harder to, to make it go straight. With a straight iron plane like this, um, you can do the same thing. You can use your fingers as a fence um, to, to plane that, that rabbit and it's much easier to hold that straight line. Um, and by, by using a marking gauge line uh, also helps as well. I though tend not to use these types of planes for establishing rabbits, I tend to use the unfenced rabbit planes for adjusting rabbits. And if we look at the historical record and we look at, at, at uh, books like Peter Nicholson's Mechanic's Companion, he discusses both fenced and unfenced rabbit planes. He refers to fenced rabbit planes um, as sinking rabbit planes designed for sinking the rabbit. Um, and these, uh, I forget the term that he uses, but essentially they're trimming rabbit planes. They're for adjusting the rabbit uh, to the marking gauge lines. So when he talks about planing rabbits, he is suggesting that even though this has a fence and a depth stop, we don't necessarily rely on the fence and the depth stop. We scribe marking gauge lines. We use the fence and the depth stop on the moving filster plane to get us close and then we trim down to those mark and gauge lines perfectly with this uh, rabbit plane with the unfenched version. Moving filister planes um, can be found in wooden and metal versions. This happens to be a metal version from Veritas. Um, there are wood, old wooden moving filisters. You can buy new wooden moving filisters. Um, and 
The one thing that most moving filister planes all have in common is, the, again, is this skewed iron, which allows them to sink rabbits across the grain very cleanly. And they also have some type of scoring iron. Uh, it could be a separate blade. It could be a small cutting wheel like this one here that gets adjusted up or down, depending on whether you're cutting with the grain or across the grain. And most moving filisters also have some type of of depth stop uh, in addition to the fence. And the fence just helps you to position that rabbit. Um, you can find moving filisters that have straight irons. Uh, the Stanley 78 is an example of that. Um, however, those planes, even though they have scoring irons, tend not to do such a good job planing rabbits across the grain. The, um, a plane with a skewed iron is going to do a much better job planing across the green. So let's set up a board and, uh, and see just how, uh, how well these planes work at sinking a rabbit. So as Peter Nicholson suggests, I've uh, gone ahead and gauged a line on here with a marking gauge where my rabbit's going to go. I've penciled it in so you could see it a little better. I've set my fence so that I come just about to that gauge line. Um, and I set my depth stop just shy of my depth. And I'm going to start up here at this end. Now some folks don't like this knob. Um, I find that if I just put my thumb on it and put my fingers on the fence, that works okay. Um, I also you know, will sometimes just put my hand here on the plane. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm putting my fingers um, I'm putting my fingers on the fence. Um, want to be careful that you don't nick them on the blade on this style of plane. Get them on the fence and that's going to help you to push the, uh, the plane into the, uh, into the board and keep it nice and square. I'm going to start on the end and I'm going to take cut, move back a little, take another cut, move back a little more. And each time I'm pushing in this way towards the board with this hand while I'm just gently pushing the plane forward uh, with my rear hand. And this wood's a little stringy. This is spruce. It is not the best uh, wood in the world for this demonstration, um, but it should still make a pretty decent rabbit. And the one thing I do like about having two separate planes, as Peter Nicholson suggests, is that I can set my fenced rabbit plane for a fairly coarse cut. Now you can see there, I'm, uh, I'm already bottoming out my depth stop. So I'm actually gonna raise my depth stop just a little bit so that I can take a few more passes. But I'm taking a fairly thick cut with this plane. You can actually hear, um, hear the shaving, and I'll even move this depth stop out of the way completely. You can hear that that is not a, um, a thin little shaving. And that's the benefit of having two rabbit planes, uh, as suggested by Nicholson, is that you can set your fenced rabbit plane up for a nice thick cut that'll allow you to hog away material very quickly and get close to that depth for your rabbit. Then when you get close, you can switch to a much finer set plane, take off those nice fine little shavings, clean up the rabbit, and get a nice smooth clean rabbit. You can turn, use these planes on their side to clean up to your shoulder line. So if you've got any little strings there, you can clean those up. If it's out of square at all, you can clean that up. And those combination of those two planes allow you to work very quickly and very precisely. Now you can see here I haven't quite hit my line, but the beauty, again, of the unfenced rabbit plane is that I can come back, take partial shavings, 
watch my gauge line and I can hit it perfectly by using that marking gauge. So there you go. So we've got a nice consistent, clean, square rabbit. And we were able to make it quickly by using a combination of a, a heavily set fenced rabbit plane followed by a very finely set unfenced rabbit plane to clean up that rabbit uh, and get down to our gauge lines. Thanks for watching everyone. If you like this video and would like to see more videos like it, please take a minute to click that thumbs up icon, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment below. If you'd like to submit your own questions to be answered here in a future video, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash brfinewoodworking for all the details. Our patrons help us to continue to create quality content like these videos and our bi-weekly audio podcast without subjecting you to annoying sponsorship ads. And as a Patreon supporter, you can submit your own questions to be answered in a future video right here on the channel. So thanks again for watching, and until next time, stay sharp.